Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is John Maschalino. I'm a board member of FedCap, and I have the honor of uh, welcoming everyone today to the FedCap's 13th Solution Series. This series was launched in 2010 to bring thought leaders together to explore the issues facing businesses in the 21st century. Since our initial session in 2011, we have focused on the employment of veterans. Over 2,400 people have participated in these events, both in person and via live streaming. I also have the privilege this morning of introducing Christine Quinn, who I have had the privilege of knowing throughout my legal career in government service. Christine currently serves as the President Chief Executive Officer of WIN, Women in Need, helping homeless New York City women and their children transform their lives. But she has done much more than that for our city. She was elected to the New York City Council to represent the 3rd District in Manhattan, which represents neighborhoods such as Chelsea, Greenwich Village, and Clinton, and had the privilege of becoming the third and only speaker of the New York City Council and the first woman to hold that office. She was um, the first, the first female, as I said, as I said, and now uh, and has done so much more for the city of New York. She'd worked for Governor Cuomo, was a candidate for mayor, and I know will continue to do great things for this city and anything that she chooses to do. And it's a privilege that she has gone back to the not-for-profit world to help those in need. So without further ado, I welcome my friend and former colleague, Christine Quinn. It's funny, government, city hall roads always continue to cross throughout one's life, which is a nice thing. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And I want to just start by thanking, uh, where did Chris go? She's in the back cleaning up, or, right, right back to work. No, I just want to congratulate you and thank you and FedCap for doing this solution series and this being the 13th one of them. I think that makes a big statement about FedCap's vision for uniting people, bringing to people together, and having open conversation about what at times can be seen as complicated or even controversial topics. So thank you and the team at FedCap. And I want to thank the panelists for being here this morning and sharing their insights. And, you know, timing being everything, I'm just saying, um, yeah. without saying. Uh, but even beyond that, uh, the, it's re I think this conversation about women leadership, how we bring more women into the workforce at higher levels, the different way people can sometimes lead if they're a woman or in my opinion, from a community that hasn't been represented at the highest levels of fill in the blank, really is very important and not discussed enough. And I just wanna start with just a quick fact given my life now running WIN, which is, uh, used to be called Women in Need, which is the largest provider of shelter and permanent supportive housing to homeless families, women and children. 70% of the people who slept in a shelter last night in New York City were families with children. And nobody really knows that. I'll tell you, I didn't know that statistic before I started. I mean, I have a theory why you don't know that because Rupert Murdoch puts racist pictures of single homeless men on the cover of the New York Post to separate us. But that's another discussion for another solution series, and I don't want to cause FedCap any more problems than I probably already have by attacking <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, who, I don't know, could be a huge donor to FedCap. Anyway, and 46%, now we at Win, we're the largest provider. We house 10% or more of all the homeless families every night. 4,700 people last night, 2,500 children. 46% of our moms are working. They're working, sometimes two or three jobs, and they don't make enough money to pay the rent. That's one of the underlying issues your conversation today will relate to. Now, it may not be the front question that get asked, but how we see women in the workforce, how we see the skills of women or don't see them is very related to that reality. And the reality that poverty is a disease that strikes women more and more harshly than men. And we need to know that. And sometimes I think, well, you're talking about who's gonna be the CEO or the CFO or the C whatever, whatever, oh, but it all relates. It all relates. 
because everything's a pipeline up, and it's all about how we see the potential of women. Now take, for example, some of the moms in wind shelters. A lot of them, some of them have uh, high school degrees, a few have college degrees, but boy, do they have life experience, right? And I was chatting with uh, a woman before from Westchester who's a, a high-level HR consultant. Well, how we see life experience of women, how we see the strength of the struggles they've been through, how we see the huge accomplishment of graduating from, you know, a community college, and how do we weight that against people with four years degrees? or people who are lucky enough to have parents who could play for graduate school, but have no life experience. That's the conversation you're gonna have this morning. And in my opinion, not to sound too, you know, hyperbole -y -y -y, or whatever the right version of that word would be, that's a really radical conversation. And it's a radical conversation for a group as significant as FedCap to lead and for business leaders to participate in because it says not everyone's the same. And that's not bad to say that. It's a great recognition. But in everybody's distinct uniqueness, we need to think about how we seize the potential of that uniqueness to make our workforce better, stronger, and bigger, and what we all have to do to change our practices. And I'll give you one example at Wynn. We, I've only, I'll be, be a, win a year uh, next month, so pretty soon I can't like, be like, and it's always been this way. But now I still can, because I'm only in month 11. Um, I met one of our maintenance workers, and maintenance workers at a shelter are very, very important. I mean, you've all heard the stories of conditions when they were very, very important. And I was visiting one of our shelters in the Bronx last meet, and I met this uh, man who was, you could just tell, like when I walked in, he was clean. And uh, I had a kind of open meeting with all of the staff at the shelter, and somebody said, well, why is X still a temp? And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, he's been a temp for three years. I said, well, that seems ridiculous. And all of the other maintenance and security guards were saying, he's so great, he's so great. So I went back to Win and I said to the person he reports to, why has X been a, a temp at, at X shelter for three years? Everybody loves him. Well, we have a rule here in HR that you have to have a high school degree to be a maintenance worker. I said, well, generally that seems a little stupid, one. <laughs> B, we're trying to help our residents get GEDs, and now we're gonna say no to people who, and, and he's great and everybody loves him. So we don't have that rule anymore, right? And it's not, so I, I say that to not say like I'm some nonprofit, blah, 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 pointing fingers at the corporate world, I'm not. We all need to examine these issues. But when corporate America does it, it has an enormous ripple effect. Because why do places like Winter Fed Cap maybe take on those ideas? Because we think that's the model of corporate America and we think we're doing better if we're modeling corporate America. So I just want to thank you all for taking this on um, and moving us all forward. You have great panelists, particularly Anna. It was fun to get to see Anna this morning. And I'm now going to introduce uh, Lori Lutz, who I have to say, we just met, but I can tell already she's a dynamo because the second I walked in, she was like, okay, this is what we're doing and this is what you're doing and now you need coffee, go get coffee. That <laughs> is a girl you want in yeah. charge. So thank you all very much. to it, and I want to highlight it, and I know our panelists will do the same. Could this be any more timely? <clears throat> we are in a, an environment right now where having a conversation about women as leaders is probably as important as it's ever been in our country's history. And so I want to begin by introducing four amazing women who have agreed to be with us today, some coming as far as Chicago, others from various boroughs within the um, city and others from Rhode Island. So let me begin. Sarah Carson. Sarah is the founder of Leona, and I really encourage you to get on that website. It's a women's contemporary clothing collection that's designed and manufactured in New York City. Sarah was honored with the Design Entrepreneur New York
York City distinction in 2012. And in that same year, Leota was named one of Inc.'s 50 fast growing companies. Um, in 2014 and in 2015, Leota was included in Inc.'s 500 fastest growing privately owned companies in America. So join me in welcoming Sarah. Gina Burns has more than 30 years as a leader in the interior design industry. Gina is currently the managing director of Perkins and Will Chicago office. By the way, Perkins and Will was started in 1935, which makes it a, kind of a partner of FedCap, which was our origin year, and Chicago is their founding office. Sarah, I mean, uh, Gina's insights and instincts have cultivated exceptional interdisciplinary design teams. Under Gina's leadership, Perkins and Will has been recognized by Interior Design Magazine as the 2015 Most Admired Firm on Architectural Records 2015 list of top architectural firms and as AIA Chicago's 2016 Firm of the Year. Gina was also named Chicago Business Journal's Women of Influence in 2016. Gina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Denise has more than 25 years of experience in the financial sector in both retail and commercial lending. She's currently the financial portfolio manager in Rhode Island Commerce Commission, um, Commerce Corporation. She was previously the executive director for the Minority Investment Development Corp and the Rhode Island Coalition for Minority Investment. She was also the founder, co-founder, of the Emerging Women in Business Conference in Rhode Island still brings hundreds and hundreds of people each year to talk about women in business. Denise. <laughs> Anna Oliveira Oregi Perfect. is the president and CEO of the New York Women Foundation. She was um, awarded this position in 2006, and under Anna's leadership, the foundation has just blossomed and bloomed. They have sponsored really landmark research reports. They've increased visibility and public awareness for women and social issues and social equity. They have made profound impact because of the millions of dollars that they have contributed to women's issues in the city. So, Anna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Mark. What a panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'd like to begin by emphasizing that it's, um, and Gina, this is to you, the research is basically incontrovertible. McKenzie, Bloomberg, Hagelin, they all say that when women are in the boardroom or when women are in the C-suite, business are simply more profitable. This holds true for both return on equity, which is 35% higher, and total return to shareholders, which is 34% higher. Yet, check this out. Among the Fortune 500 companies, 5% are led by women CEOs. So Gina, let's start. Two questions for you. First question, why in 2016 do you think that that is still the reality, especially given the fact that when women are leaders, businesses are more successful financially? And secondly, why do you think they are more? Well, I think the uh, when you look at Fortune 500, first of all, good morning, everybody. I should start with that. Um, I'm a Chicagoan, as you can tell by my voice. Um, but I think women in leadership positions in the boardroom at Fortune 500 companies is, is a bit of a pipeline issue, quite frankly. Um, I was doing some fact checking as I was preparing, and in 1979, percent of women graduated universities with business degrees. In 2001, 50% of women graduated. And I think that as if you look at the base of the pyramid, <clears throat> it's just the pipeline, right? It's not, it's taking some time to get to that point for women. Um, I think that, so it will be there in mass in time, um, which I think is very encouraging. I think that's one of the reasons why women have um, moved into entrepreneurial roles in lieu of serving on, uh, in leadership positions in corporate America. Um, I think if you're talented as a woman 
and you have that game, as I'll call it, um, like my partner here, sometimes you step off that track and uh, choose to be an entrepreneur because your leadership skills, as you know them, are much easier to leverage and you get where you want to go much faster, quite frankly, when you're on your own. But as women continue to grow in the business, broader business community, I see us filling many of those leadership positions uh, as time goes on. And to your point about why women uh, are so effective in those roles, I, I think women in general, and I, I, I think it's very hard to generalize, but I will say that women have, I think, a very balanced point of view um, in leadership roles. I think that they look at the world um, through a diverse lens um, because of our own personal experiences, and I think that brings great value to uh, corporations. Wonderful, thank you. So you, um, when we were speaking, talked about the fact, and I love this statement, if, if a person's in will is going to be successful, we need to understand the broad array of, of the market. Right. And your language, if I might quote it, was, um, a group of white men sitting in the boardroom do not reflect the market. And I thought that was a really important statement because it begs the conversation about the diversity of perspectives. And that was just powerful to me. So Denise, yes. when Gina talked about this diversity of perspectives, um, that was a great foundational piece. And when you and I spoke, you thought that women in leadership uh, added additional skills and perspectives that we are able to leverage. Could you speak to that? Yeah, my, um, again, good morning. Uh, my experience uh, has taught me that women approach things uh, differently uh, with regards to uh, problem solving, um, also project management. We have a different mindset and a different thought pattern and we use our organizational skills really to impact productivity and, and growth and, and culture, business culture. In general, we tend to be more collaborative. We like teamwork. Um, we uh, do a check-in a lot of times in terms of surveying um, and really just um, scanning the, the landscape um, to sort of get where we need to go. Um, and this has a lot of intrinsic uh, value um, I think, um, in, in really making things come together and um, putting forth uh, leadership in a lot of situations. Um, part of that is networking, and we do that very well among ourselves. Um, uh, we're used to doing that. It's just sort of part of our lives. Um, we, we do that to an end in terms of reaching goals. However, the challenge is to network outside of just um, the women's world, women to woman, and to be able to um, be able to effectively network so that you can really bring in business and do effective marketing. So that's where the challenge is. I, I have an example that comes to mind where um, I know of a Latina entrepreneur, and she basically thought like, wow, wouldn't it be good if we could have white-owned businesses and, um, and Latino businesses come together to be able to understand what their, each other's needs are in attracting customers. And so what she did was she um, different venues at different Spanish businesses and she would have uh, the other white owned businesses come in uh, to learn about the culture, to learn about their clients and also uh, would do some translation in order to make that happen. Uh, she did this for several times and and um, I was able to see that there was a new type of business marketing that was able to be done because of what she had put in place. And I think because she was that type of um, entrepreneurial woman um, and had that mindset in terms of doing something different, those things were able to happen. Uh, outside of that, in a corporate environment, um, women face, um, they face, the old boys network in, in terms of it's already pr pretty established, their path is pretty straight and, and, and cut in terms of where they're going for their goals. Um, but for women, we actually have to work harder and smarter, um, maybe for the same goals uh, that, that are in place for men because we don't have that support um, that, that typically you would have in moving straight forward. And, and uh, from, from a male's uh, perspective. Thank you, Denise. 
So, we talked about diversity of lens. We talked about these different skills, especially as it relates to networking and building teams. And some of that may be generalized, but in our conversation, you really see that consistently or indicated. So, Sarah, both of these things start to allude to a culture. And we all know that culture eats vision for lunch, right? I mean, culture matters in terms of building success. And one of the things that I thought was intriguing is here you were climbing that corporate ladder at USC. You were a very successful investment banker. And you basically left that career, the rear window, and moved forward and started your own business. That's quite a leap. And I have been so interested and intrigued by the process. And here you are, starting from whole cloth, not to use a pun. But starting this business, and I'm intrigued to know, what were some of the elements that you said in order to be a successful business person and a woman as a leader, this is what my corporation is going to look like. What were some of those elements? Well, good morning, everybody. I loved my career on Wall Street and had every opportunity at UBS, and they really had me on the fast track for success there. At the same time, the male-dominated culture got old. And being a director level for the company and still being asked to go get coffee and take out the dry cleaning um, started to wear on me over time. And also, sexual harassment can be alienating over time. So at the same time, I wanted to do something that I was passionate about. So I decided I wasn't, in it. I wasn't a lifer on Wall Street. And I loved making dresses. And I thought I had an idea for a brand. So I grew my company from packing my own boxes in the corner of my garment center factory to a global brand selling to over 200 stores internationally on our website, leota.com, and to some of the top retailers in the world, like Nordstrom, Lord & Taylor, Anthropology. So I spent a lot of time envisioning the type of culture that I wanted to have at my company, a culture of empowerment, autonomy, personal responsibility, and results-oriented. Our distinctly feminist culture comes across in everything we do at Leota. Uh, we make fashion for everybody. Have you noticed that the fashion world hasn't exactly figured out that we're not all 20 years old, Caucasian, <laughs> size two? I don't know that too. <laughs> so my company, or my company serves all women. So we make contemporary sizing, full figure, maternity, petites. We just launched a children's line. And our concept is that women want to be comfortable. They don't want to be like cooped up in something super tight while they're out there trying to change the world. So Leota dresses are comfortable, versatile, machine washable, wrinkle free, basically solutions for women out there doing it all. We also produce right here in New York because ethical production is very important to me. And I think that consumers have a very high BS meter nowadays. So the authenticity of what we're doing with our culture comes across in everything we do, whether it's in our business practices, how we treat our vendors and employees, to the product that we sell. From a leadership perspective, one reason I think we've had success, and I learned this from my mom, actually, is that I'm very willing to be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong. I'll admit it. Um, I actively seek to surround myself with people that know more than me. So I hire for my weaknesses. And I am also fine with being vulnerable. And I don't think that makes me weak. In fact, I think it makes me stronger. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've never made the same mistake twice. And I'm very familiar with that feeling. I'm sure you are, too, when you realize that you've screwed up whether it's you've sent your team out searching for something that doesn't exist, or in a client meeting and they hate your proposal, 
I think the best thing we can do, I think that's a good thing, we need to realize that we're wrong and pivot immediately. And I think that honesty and agility is something that's really worked for me in building my business. Thank you, Sarah. I think we um, all kind of looked at each other, because in our leadership academy, we just spent some time talking about the concept of pivoting and course correction and corporate agility. And that's hard to do, and it demands um, vulnerability we talk about. It, it demands this willingness to understand the data and say that I'm wrong, and I really appreciate that. Thanks, Sarah. So Anna, we've heard Denise and Sarah and Gina speak to culture in many ways. And the Women's Foundation has been um, something I've spent a lot of time on your website. I'm awestruck by your fight for social justice and equity for women. And you had one article Why aren't women advancing at work a perspective of a transgender? And I'm going to just read a little snippet from it, and there's two comments I have to make. Ben Barris, the biologist at Sanford, who lived and worked as Barbara Barris until he was in his 40s. For most of his career, he experienced bias. But he didn't think a lot about it. He didn't give much weight to it. He saw it as discrete incidents. When he became Ben, however, he kind of moved to a different part of the organization. He immediately noticed a difference in his everyday work experience. People simply treated me with more respect. I'm listened to very differently. My authority is rarely questioned. I'm not interrupted when I speak at meetings. And then he responded to this, remember Larry Summers' gaffe when he said that women just innately don't have the ability to um, understand and appreciate the sciences? He responded to Larry's gaffe by saying this. This is why women are not breaking into top-level academic jobs at any appreciable rate. It's not childcare. It's not skill. It's not intellect. It's not family responsibilities. It's that men are simply taken more seriously. Wow, Anna. What is the foundation doing? And what you you posted that on the website for a precise reason. Can you speak to this? So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Laurie, and thank you for ha having us and, and for the timing of this conversation. Um, that's totally about culture and behavior, right? Because culture uh, defines norms of behavior. Um, let me say two things about the foundation. We are a public foundation. Um, that means that we actually fundraise. We're not an endowed foundation. We do have an endowment, but it's not a significant endowment. And that creates a different relationship to money and a different relationship to understanding of philanthropy and understanding of the, the role of gender in philanthropy. Um, I do want to say that the foundation is probably better at what it does because of the people that are around it, the grantee partners, the donors, um, our staff and our board members, and I want to say that I'm we're very honored that Ginny Malgraf, a board member of the foundation, is here. And I want to acknowledge you. Um, and um, so the issue of gender, the issue of culture, you know, even the name of an institution that says the New York Women's Foundation, right? And it immediately genderizes the, the, the institution, right? And um, the reason why, and for us, you know, we include all women, so trans women are included in our work. Um, and I'm going to say gender non-conforming folk also are. So the gift that I think Ben is giving us in that article is that um, how gender is expressed actually makes an enormous difference in how people are perceived. That's what the moral is, right? It doesn't even have to do too much with biology. That it has to do with gender expression. And I'm going to say that gender expression is not just applicable to women. Gender is a construct that creates male, female, and because of the trans movement, you know, has debunked that only simple polarization, right? And everything in between in the expressions of gender. So when we talk about gender, we're talking about women, but we're also talking about trans community members. We're talking about gender fluid 
individuals, and we're talking about men. The conversation today is focusing on women, but as far as gender norms and gender, with the norms, gender stereotypes, that means what's acceptable for men to do, what's acceptable for women to do. What happens when people transition from a gender to the other and how they are related to in the world? And what that article says is that when the gender expression is from female to male transition, the level of privilege in the perception of competence, in the perception of validity of what people say and do, of their expertise, goes up. And the same is through the reverse. When we have males to female transition, there is a different type, you know, there's a, there's a loss, a relative loss of being um, perceived as a competent, as a valuable person. So I also wanted to say that gender is not the only determinant that shapes us. These are very deeply ingrained things that we begin, you know, at whatever day one, the messages, the, the way that people approach babies, beginning lives, if they are perceived to be female, male, etc. How we relate, it's so deeply ingrained. But I do want to say that race, ethnicity, color is totally imbued in, imbued in it. And it also shapes the norms of gender and many times trumps some of those norms. Now, people don't choose to be Latino or male or female, black, male, female, Asian. It, it is all together. It is embedded together. And um, how we are perceived then is really important. It's really important that we understand the constructs and the cultures that we're in. What's so good about the timing of this conversation is that, in my opinion, periodically, there are what I would say culture explosions, uh, opportunities that happen in which the denuding of the various structures of separation and categorization of human beings, males, females, transgender, black, Latino, brown, white, yellow, green, you know what I mean? That those various things and how they serve certain purposes of separation, of division, is periodically they, they come out very denuded. They come out in an explosion. And I would propose to us that they show how obsolete they are and how dehumanizing they are. Now, it's really important to understand that the, the fact of dehumanization as devaluing it's not just to the person that is being, at the moment, put down. Let me just say disregard or put down. It is a dehumanizing effect for the other party as well. Because to oppress somebody, you have to be an oppressor. And that in and of itself is a set of norms that shuts down the full, full humanity. So I think that the value of where we are and what I hear from my colleagues are ways to advance shifting those failed ways of looking at each other and of being with each other that are actually, we get. We get that market issues are there. We get that thinking issues are there. There's a conversation about that when you have different perspectives, and you can actually have what I would say cultural humility around the perspectives, not be ranking them, but you actually can look at them, the solutions, because this is a series about solutions, the solutions are better. Now, there's a big debate, which is, you know, I think that folk that live, in, grow up in situations where in different ways we have to cope with these systems of devaluing, grow assets, grow competences, grow a nimbleness, an ability to read other people, an ability to relate to audiences, an ability to use the underestimation to one's favor, the ability to network, the ability to bring people together, that others that do not have to do that in order to 
make progress in life don't have. So I would say that, but that is not the way to solve this. This is the way that an individual makes progress. To solve this and have win-win propositions, each of us needs to understand how do we use the place where I am to look at my implicit bias. This is not about guilt. This is about effectiveness. What I hear Sarah say is that she's more invested in being effective than in being right, right? So my invitation is for us to think about uh, the, how obsolete it is for us in advancing ourselves collectively and individually to remain invested in this. And that means seizing the moment. We used to be in implicit bias. I think we are in explicit bias moment now. Um, and thank you. So Medbrand, I appreciate so much your insight and perspective. Yeah, I know it's very long for that, but I'm going to be there. <laughs> Gina, um, it's an interesting thing to um, examine my next question through the lens of Anna's comments, because when you start to think about what it means, what happens when women lead, not just from a financial equity perspective of the company, not just return to stockholders, but let's think about what happens when we've um, overcome and combat those biases as leaders in terms of philanthropic and giving a social responsibility. Because I think it's fascinating. If you look historically, just in the past 20 years, when you have women as leaders, each additional women board director translates to an added 2.3 million in philanthropic giving. And for every percent increase in women corporate offices, for every percent, companies give an additional $5.7 million in corporate philanthropic gifts. What in the world do you think drives this, Gina? What have you seen? What's your experience? And how does this tie to comments? Well, I think uh, generosity is good for business. Um, I think tolerance is good for business. Acceptance is good for business. And I think women intuitively get this. Um, at Perkins and Will, we have a program called the 1% Solution, where we give 1% of our profits every year to, in addition to philanthropic, just direct giving, but to projects that benefit not-for-profits um, in the form of architectural and design services. And I see the individuals in our office that get the opportunity to work on these projects. You can bring any project forward, and there's a team in each office that reviews these projects and says, yes, we're going to commit to this. And we do full design service and documentation for these uh, not-for-profits. And it's, it's a powerful way to create change um, in our community um, broadly, and we do this all over the world. And I think women just understand the strength of what this does for our communities and again back to pulling people up and making a difference in their lives just makes tremendous sense for business right i mean you're connecting to others you're understanding others and it feels great to do that one of the things that i, I appreciated in our conversation is you talked about the fact that there might just be an inherent dna Yes. That, that causes us to um, be fundamentally committed to the broader community, to the broader lens. I think that was an intriguing perspective. Yeah, we talked a little bit about, um, and I don't know if it's that women you know, raise families and connect to the broader family context that drives that. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I, I think there is something in our DNA that makes uh, giving feel uh, very powerful. And I think maybe that's an interesting perspective that I wanted to bring out, the power that results from having a strong social responsibility. So leading through that lens of power and making a difference in the community, I think that's, that's really an important statement. So let's think about this. We have data that suggests that women, as leaders, pre create basically more um, financial success. We have data that suggests that women, as leaders, end up having much greater corporate philanthropic orientation. And yet, try starting a business as a woman leader. And by the way, women leaders are launching
launching businesses at an all-time rate, and yet it is fraught with challenges. And Denise, when you and I spoke about this, you had, um, and you talked about um, the specific research, which I think you all might find very interesting. Um, women receive only 7% of all venture capital funding, and 5% of all federal contract awards, and traditional banks only lend women about 5% now, one study found, and maybe there's a correlation between these data, that startups run by women on average take just about 10,000 bucks to get out of their way. You had some interesting perspectives on this too. Yes. Um, Although we're, we're, we can be very innovative with what we have, what we have to work with. Um, we, from practical experience, with it could be anything from family responsibilities, multitasking, budgeting, uh, we really know how to get something done with less. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing when you go into business because a lot of times the, the women entrepreneurs that I work with, they were pretty undercapitalized, but they pulled together what they could in order to jumpstart their business. Um, a lot of times uh, women will reach out to friends and family, um, someone that uh, not only will give support, but also uh, we'll be able to assist along the way as, as things happen. Uh, there's a lot of cash flow crunches along the way, and uh, that's, that's who a lot of women uh, turn to uh, when they're entrepreneurial and just starting out. Um, but there is a serious lack of equity uh, that's apparent um, on, uh, in terms of the balance sheets of, of these um, entrepreneurial women. And um, we have to recognize that there needs to be um, more, uh, uh, more venture capital opportunities for women with wonderful ideas and lots of energy and um, you know, just a, a lot of hard work that's put into this. Um, my experience in terms of on the lender side is really talking about the benefit. <laughs> Basically, uh, as a friend of mine used to say, perception is reality. And a lot of traditional lenders, um, when women are applying for funds, they sort of don't really take them seriously. Um, they're almost less credible than their male, male counterparts. And so uh, what happens is that they're sort of saying, well, you know, that's all well and good, but when push comes to shove, she probably isn't going to see this through because she has uh, family commitments, caregiving commitments, you know, it just becomes more of a hobby. And I, I've seen that proven wrong uh, time and time again. So a lot of this whole um, uh, benefit as it is in terms of men um, having uh, uh, a, a better advantage in terms of the, the lending and financial piece is, is true. So you decided to do something about that. And one, and I'd love you to talk about this concept of emerging women in business, because I think there's, it, there's layers of that, that that actually reflect everything we said so far. But you launched Emerging Women in Business. It was conference, it was still, you know, conversations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so the Emerging Women in Business Conference actually was an idea that was started uh, with myself and uh, the executive director for the seminar, uh, Center for Women in Enterprise in Providence, Rhode Island. And what we had realized were that a lot of women, particularly uh, low, low moderate income women, um, needed to have supports among themselves. They needed to have education. And uh, to know how to approach right, to, it, not, not only that, but just to be able to set up their business, what it was to start a business, and they needed to have motivation from people like, let's say, a Sarah or someone who is already in the business, who has been through um, a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of lot of the, the uh, uh, difficulties in establishing the business. So that, that was really important for women to, to see and to experience. And so it was really um, uh, putting that all together in a form where you can talk one-on-one, -on -one, you can network one-on-one, -on -one, you can learn the things that you needed to do to take the next steps. And so that's what our mission was always for people to leave there to take the next steps. Love it. Sounds like kind of an innovation that we might be very interested in pursuing. Thank you so much. So Sarah. I had this conversation, this wonderful conversation with Denise, and 
Um, I love how she indicated that, you know, we just know how to multitask. We know how to do more with less. And, and it's not right, it's not fair, but it's true. And so I picked up the phone and we had this great conversation. And you had a pretty strong reaction to the whole concept of 5%, 7%, 5%. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Well, the fact that women are starting businesses with so much less access to capital, it's not right. You know who is starting the most businesses in America right now? Women. And they only have 5% of the venture capital funding and only 5% of the bank funding. What's wrong with this picture, right? I think, I just imagine what we could achieve if we had equal access to that kind of capital to fund our businesses. I mean, right now it's just creating this anemic growth environment for female entrepreneurs. I mean, what if we had that equality? Imagine what we can do. So I think the next step for women founders is to really demand that access. I think that's really our next challenge. One of the things that you said is, frankly, I'm really done with doing more with less. I love that statement. The other thing that you said, and I, I want to ask you this question. OK, so you have less money. What does that mean for you as a startup? What does it mean for you when you're no longer a startup? What does it mean for you in terms of growth in day-to-day -day business? Great question. I mean, underfunded businesses have to be ruthless in how they spend money. So at Leota, that means we're highly disciplined and we're also highly efficient and much more profitable, actually, than our competitors. We've never had the luxury of making major financial mistakes. So now we know exactly how to spend money to make money. So the result at my company is astronomical growth. I mean, Leota was named on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in America for two years in a row and in the top 10 run by women in New York. So we've also been profitable since year two, and I'm still 100% owner of the company. Um, and we've done all of this just by reinvesting cash flow. So we've become a global force in fashion, literally on a shoestring. But frankly, I'm done with doing more with less. Over it. <laughs> so, ready for the gravy train. So, bring it on. Um, and basically, I am ready to scale this business, and it's going to take some significant investment to get it to the, the scale that I envision for the company. So, I'm really not interested in being a small business. I really appreciated those comments for a lot of different reasons, but one of them um, spoke to the environment, the banking environment spoke to the lending environment generally, and it also spoke to um, the whole cultural environment. So Anna, um, there's two things that I, I want you to, if you could speak to, and one we haven't actually talked about, but given Sarah and Denise's comments, I'm curious to know, does the foundation play a role in nudging the lending environment, and if so, what is that role? And then. Secondly, previously, each um, panelist spoke to the idea of pipelines and mentoring and the importance of having individuals lead us and guide us. And so I wonder, in some ways, if you could speak um, to the issue of, of creating that pipeline and the role that the foundation plays in that. Thank you. So um, we. Um, have in our mission an enormous commitment to what we call economic security and justice. Through that set of priorities, we actually have to use philanthropy as a catalytic tool. By that we mean we can't, it's not going to be the place where all you know, women-owned businesses are going to get their financing, but we can show the field, we can show others that it's a great investment. So over the years, the foundation is almost 30 years old, two-thirds of our grant making, and currently it's a six million dollars a year in New York City, so I would say about three and a half to four million dollars is invested in economic security. Job training programs, job placement programs, but also women's entrepreneurship. So what we have 
uh, had extraordinary results. Because of who we are, we see women as assets. We see women as entrepreneurial leaders that actually are doing a lot with very little. In philanthropy, you know, the investment in women is also 7% which I wanted to say to debunk myths that you think that philanthropy is much more advanced than all the other sectors, we're not. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, and that's women in general, let alone women of color is much less than that, um, you know, immigrants much less than that, so just as a whole. So the results are enormous. The results are like nine to 12 times fold. Um, doing what? giving grants to organizations that support women working in their own community with their, themselves as entrepreneurial businesses. I want to give one example for you to check out, if you don't know them already, Hot Bread Kitchen. Does anybody know Hot Bread Kitchen here? Oh good, a couple of people know that. So the foundation um, began to fund Hot Bread Kitchen, first foundation funder of Hot Bread Kitchen. We are risk takers that way. Think of it as we see women coming together, baking their bread that they bring from their culture and families and countries of origin. You know, the specialty breads, I mean, I love bread, so I'm just saying that. The specialty <laughs> breads that cost a gazillion dollars at Whole Foods, etc. right? So you see women that are not at that point necessarily super proficient in English that are not at that point perceiving themselves as business women. Working in a group, working with each other, and creating a business that today, it's uh, in La Marqueta at 115 on Park Avenue. I encourage you to go. But you can find their products in many other well-established outfits. So what do they do? It's a group of people that began immigrant women. They um, do job training in the particularly the bakery industry. They also incubate entrepreneurial folk that are doing their, their work. And the third thing that they are doing now, they launch, they notice, for, so for instance, somebody um, through our grants is, has a little business, let's say, making rum cakes, okay? Another person has, and this is true, this fantastic ice cream um, line of products. Alone, it's very hard for them to grow fast enough and develop a share of market that they can actually grow as an independent business because the line of products is very small. So Hot Red Kitchen began to look at that and said, what if we do a cooperative? So they came to us and we've begun to fund them. Nobody has ever done this. By the way, we're the place for you to come if you have that kind of situation. We fund community, you know, responses that are ingenious responses that look at people as assets, not as lacking things, but as having assets that need to be invested in. Literally, capital is really important. Philanthropy is about capital as well, just like bank loans are about capital. So they, are, they just launched a cooperative that has micro entrepreneurs there. In the first two weeks, two weeks, these were folks that were struggling in the market. They booked more than $2,000 in business already. I was at their graduation and launch last Thursday afternoon. So these are very, very fresh data. So what does it tell us? It tells us that if the investments are done in that authentic manner that was talked about here, looking at women as assets and looking not at what's wrong that they don't have, but what is it that we from another sector can contribute by contrast and in a complementary manner from an equal place. So the returns on investment are enormous. We have been able to propel some of the giving of the foundation because of their expertise. What did it require from me? What does it require from investors? Our ability to see them. Our ability to look at our own biases and judgments of who is a good you know, investment opportunity and who is not. And what we're talking about today is that the, the traditional perception about gender hold us all back those that need the capital and those that have the capital. So it could be a win-win. To your second question about pipeline mentorship, I'm just gonna say something very brief. I learned from um, incredible men changing the world that mentorship is not enough, that sponsorship is more powerful. 
And what does that mean? It means that we just don't talk with people and say, look, I, I did this when I was going through that situation. Have you considered that? That's very important, very important. But that we actually take risks on behalf of each other. That we actually say, I have a great person for that job that you have over there. I want to introduce you to this entrepreneurial person that is doing this at this point. You use your assets, your privilege, your, your brand as an individual, as a professional, to bring along and you take a little risk in your brand with the other person. So I would say that for the tipping points, we didn't use this con concept, but I think we're looking for tipping points. I think that we're looking for, we're doing everybody here. If you're here today, you're part of the solution already. Right? Those that are listening are also part of the solution. What can we do together to do that tipping point so that we take this opportunity for a much higher return on investment for all of us financially, humanly, human capital, and financial capital? And yeah, thank you. So we have about eight minutes left, and I'm going to ask the panel one quick question, and then I'm going to turn it over for some questions from the audience. So I'd like to ask you each in a very brief way, um, and Sarah, I'll start with you. You're successful. You're rocking and rolling. What's one to two really precise elements of success um, and recommendation that you give to women who want to lead? Well, first of all, success is a moving target. It's a moving target. We never actually make it. So you've got to fall in love with the process because you're never going to get there. There's no end. Okay, there's no end. So first of all, I'll tell you what got what worked for me. I got a lot of help. Michael Jordan had like 11 coaches, okay? So I set up a lot of accountability for myself, structure around what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and then secondly, I ruthlessly curate my life. So I choose two or three things that I'm going to do. I do those really well. And I don't do the rest. I just don't do it. Everything we do comes at the expense of something else, and that's okay. And I don't feel guilty about it. No guilt. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Sarah. Denise, the same question. One or two words of wisdom and advice. I, I really feel that, especially on the corporate side, and I'm familiar with both sides, um, that women um, who are in a corporate situation, they need to have confidence in themselves. They need to be able to know when to take the risk and when, when you see an opportunity to go for it. I think a lot of opportunities are lost because we're, we're fearful of stepping out. And so I would say a lot of success has to do with being able to, to envision yourself at a higher level. And to have goals for yourself and just move along and push and, and pull in people who would be able to help you, whether they're men or women mentors. Thank you. Gina, I'm going to um, frame your question just slightly differently. There's a lot of businesses in the room today. So, what is something that a business needs to do to create this more gender balance and, as we discussed, successful environment? Well, I think. Um, I just have to answer that last question really quickly, though, too, and that, and that is just be bold. I think women um, have voices in the back of their mind that in, when you're in a room full of people, you might think something and perhaps be fearful to say it. Just say it. Be bold. Um, and I also think the issue of tenacity um, is, you know, as Donald Trump said, he admired in Hillary. And he was right on that one point. <laughs> um, is that she does not give up and uh, you know bless her for it really and uh, so but to your point I think talent um, doesn't know gender you know doesn't know race doesn't know any of those things right so if you uh, uh, to leverage and be successful in business you need top talent and you just have to look for it in each person and I think a point was made earlier about just women and, and perhaps at times in their lives need for accommodation and talent needs accommodation at times, right? You can't be at work 50, 60 hours a week perhaps at certain points in your life. It doesn't mean you're not talented. It doesn't mean the organization can't benefit from what you have to offer. So 
I think you have to be flexible in accepting talent when you can get it where you can get it. Yeah. yeah. So um, hard to follow this act here. <laughs> um, I would say that although in the United States culture everything is about the individual, right? It's a very focused on the individual. There are pros and cons of that. That, so it gives us an enormous sense of confidence and go-getters and being achievers, and that's important. But it also creates situations of blame, right, and guilt. Guilt is a paralyzing thing that doesn't lead anybody anywhere. So I would say that, and I do this, whenever I feel stumped, you know, whenever I feel um, immobilized, I try very hard to stop and think about, okay, what is my individual set of behaviors, beliefs, etc.? But really, what are the practices? What are the structures? What are the things that, and Christine Quinn gave an example of changing a practice this morning around um, you know, what promotes people, right, or hires people full time. Yeah. She gave an example of changing a practice. So I wanted to encourage us, because of the kinds of positions that we occupy, all of us here, that we do have access to look at advancing this conversation, not just at the level of individual behavior, always, always we're mindful people and we're always seeking to evolve, but looking at the practices that we can, with others, change, because the practices really change beyond that moment in time. They change what others do. So I would say for us that if we can, um, look to see what are the practices, the systems, the principles the, that we are living in that can be advanced. Love. That could be very beneficial. It's very beneficial for me. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much to the panel. So now, a couple of questions from the audience before we close out. Please, Hi. Uh, you talked a lot, everybody talked about uh, sponsorship and mentorship and coaches. How do you identify people that you would like to have as coaches? Well, I would say it's, it's interesting because I had asked this question of uh, someone who I admire and, and, and also um, has been a senior executive in corporate. Uh, and she said something very interesting, which was that a lot of people who, um, who you would consider to be a men mentor, they would love for you to ask them, would you be my mentor, to come up to them and actually, um, actually engage them you know, in a conversation around being a, a mentee. But no one asks, it's like nothing ventured, nothing gained. So, um, so I would, if you have someone in mind, I would approach them and at least get the conversation started. Interesting question. Each of us to ask how many of, that, of us have gone and said, Will you sponsor? Will you mention? Will you guide me in this system? Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Please. Um, so, looking for a solution on this uh, in terms of mission changing practices, um, oftentimes these kinds of conversations I have found, both in the workplace and even family, friends, um, can get very uncomfortable and even, you know, sort of polarized and people get sort of uh, defensive uh, and sometimes just sort of shut down. Is there, do you have advice for those of us who like to kind of bring these conversations in a non, you know, accusatory or judgmental way, just to get this sort of dialogue both in the workplace and, and in another setting? So I think it's difficult, but, um, I think it's important to depersonalize. I think that it's important to look at, that's one thing. Uh, practices are not really personal, you know, they are institutional, you know, they are ways of doing things that pe certain people will get caught in it in different ways. They, they, you know, it's, so that's the first thing, I think to depersonalize. The second thing, um, and it's really difficult, is to, for me to peel underneath and so who is losing, who's winning, and up in the appearance of winning, you know, and what kind of win is that? It's usually short term. It's usually an obsolete structure that you can forecast to people how that's gonna come to bite. So I think that, 
And I see business is doing that. When people talk about understanding the importance of inclusiveness, and I wanted to say that inclusiveness is different from diversity. Inclusiveness is different. Inclusiveness in implies sitting at the table in more e equitable and decision-making things and just having different people around. So I think that win-win solutions as much as possible, but then you have to show people that this kind of scarcity paradigm, either me or you, it's a very threatening paradigm. Yeah. And it's not even the truth in life because we don't operate like that. So it's difficult, I think it requires, it's not like, you know, like this, it requires working with people, it requires an understanding, it just requires time. Thank you, thank you. We are out of time and I wanted to ask you to join me in thanking our panel for amazing. <laughs>